Hey. Hello, 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 hello. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Good, 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 good. Glad, glad you could join us this afternoon. Yes. How's it going? Ah, you know, we're 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 staying alive. We're 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 keeping the peace. We're the struggle continues. That's what's going on. Definitely. Yeah. So, um, first of all, thank you very much for joining us on the communal. Um, the communal is a platform where we talk about different global social movements happening across the world um, so that we can connect our different struggles to each uh, each each other and then we can fight for a better a better world and so um, we we really wanted to have you on to discuss some of the things that you've done and some of the things that, that you are working on right now um, the things that you're doing in in district uh nine in harlem <laughs> yes yeah so so just uh for those of the, there are folks that might not even know or or have heard about your work so can you give folks um a brief uh history of uh what you've been up to up until you know running for uh running for uh council Definitely. So I will start by saying that my name is Kristen Richardson Jordan. I am a third generation Harlemite. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm from here, my family's from here, and there's a lot of beautiful, rich legacy uh, in the community of Harlem. So for those who don't know, we're just, you know, this historical uh, and current Black Mecca. Um, and some of that light has been dimmed a bit, but that's part of what, what we're working on is bringing it back. Um, so when you think of Harlem, you think of Harlem Renaissance, you think of, of um, Black uh, art, of uh, Black intellectuals. Um, you also think of a lot of really powerful political work. Um, one of the strongest Black Panther Party chapters uh, was right here in central Harlem. Uh, so. Um, that's the legacy that I, I like believe in and grew up with and, and, um, and, and really am continuing. It's a, a black radical tradition. It's a black freedom fighting uh, for the liberation of our, of our people. Um, now, specifically what I've been doing is that I've been a teacher and a artist activist. Uh, so I've been uh, teaching for over 10 years. I've done a lot of um, teaching the youth, uh, particularly around literacy. Uh, that's been a huge thing for, for me. I worked with a program uh, organization called Girl Be Heard, which is a, a program for young girls to find their voices, uh, majority minority students, and served in uh, school like right here in district. Um, with students who have young girls who have different abilities. Um, and then I uh, was most recently at uh, the Boys and Girls Club of Harlem, uh, working there as their literacy specialist, where I just did a lot of tutoring and also general uh, literacy work. Uh, the literacy rates in our community here in, in Harlem and District 9 are uh, low. Uh, which should not be surprising. I mean, I think for a black community across the board, um, it is something that has been an ongoing struggle because there hasn't been equity in our schools and because of white supremacy and the lack of resources and the lack of quality teachers in our schools, our students wind up not um, being at the same grade level. And it really, it sets our youth up for failure. So. Um, that's something that even as a city councilwoman, I am still going to be on my uh, on my soapbox about uh, literacy because it's it was um, it's been such a big part of the work that I've done in the past. Um, I also have done a lot of clothing drives, food giveaways. I founded a Harlem Cot Watch team, which is, as it sounds, it, it, we basically uh, filmed police activity and uh, went out in a team and watched the cops. Uh, so in cases of police abuse, uh, we could have documentation. Uh, this is now very much a general thing, uh, and I'm really excited about that. Uh, that we, we have created a cop watch culture where nowadays, if you do see something going on, uh, it is not uncommon, it is very common for people to pull out their cell phone and film 
uh, what's been what's going on with police interactions. Uh, but for a long time, that was not the case. So at the t at the point in time when it was unusual to film police activity is uh, when I was part of this cop watch team and building up that kind of culture. So. So that 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 gives people some context to 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 I guess where you are now. Um, why why did you decide then to run for office? And the the supplementary question would be, you you I watched your campaign video, and you've you've been centering this idea of radical love. So can you connect the two? Because um, uh, just just to let you know, last week. We talked to uh, some uh, uh, organizers here in Hamilton that are also trying to use, or that have, I shouldn't say trying, that have used the, the, the principle of radical love. So I just wanted to hear from your perspective how you connect the two, running for office and what radical love means to you. Oh, definitely. I, um, I, I love to hear that. And, and you know, uh, so for, for me, um, it really developed from this place of passion and service. And, you know, even when we talk about um, those who have been, who, who society would call radical, you know, um, Ella Baker once said that, you know, radical means we get at the root of things, right? So uh, those who have been revolutionary in their thinking and even in their actions, right? Um, but it really came from me thinking about that, thinking about the legacy of my community, and then realizing that all of that is rooted in love. You know, it's ultimately about serving the people, and it's about a passion for all of humanity, a, uh, a agape love, right? Where we where we look at even those we don't know, and even those who are total strangers, and even those who uh, society would typically reject, uh, and and we find compassion for them. Um, and that is uh, that is the energy that will actually change this planet. So I ran on this idea to disrupt the district with radical love and disrupting our, our district with that, to me, really just meant service, profound dignity and, and humane treatment and service. Uh, the 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 politically the principles of just everybody deserves a home, home housing is a human right um, the the food dealing with the food desert of Harlem uh, education is is deserved for everyone healthcare is deserved for everyone um, and and those are political policies and and yes those are the the type that's the type of redistributing wealth and and profound difference that makes me what many would deem a radical uh, but it is all connected to this this just profound belief that there's one human family and that's it and we are all connected and we need to um, ha be in service uh, to one another um, so that spirit uh, it led to a lot of mutual aid and, and service in my campaign. Uh, even before the pandemic, we were doing that. And that was uh, very, it's very not non-traditional. I mean, typically if someone is running for city council, uh, that person isn't doing clothing drives and food giveaways and, and wellness checks and um, a letter writing to seniors in the community. I mean, some of these things that we we did were just very unusual to the typical campaign because the typical campaign is just someone you know walking around saying "vote for me, vote for me," um, <laughs> and and um, and I really wanted to break away from that because uh, the whole principle was about pulling the community in, and that connects to why I even decided to run for office because. I am not someone who's a traditional politician. I, uh, I am actually someone who, who um, until recently had plenty of disdain and, and frankly still I do have disdain for a lot of politicians. And, um, and I really saw most politicians as people who, who take from the community and don't give and, um, and it was really a, a selfish and self-serving profession. Uh, in my eyes. And I think in a lot of ways, it's still set up to be that. So I think that's something that if you're an activist and organizer entering this space, you have to fight against that that current and that urge because um, 
uh, we won't see change unless we have different type of political leadership. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's, that's what pulled me in at the end of the day as I got inspired by some of the new elected leaders in the Congress, uh, the, the squad with you know, Ilhan Omar and AOC and Rashid Tlaib and Ayanna Presley, And I got uh, inspired by that. Um, that coupled with just really wanting the change in my community and then being anger, angry that our current uh, city councilman uh, voted for a new jails budget um, that moved $10 billion into building new jail cells. Uh, and, and which is the last thing we need is more criminalization and more mass incarceration for our community. Mm-hmm. So you know, um, uh, I I I like the fact that you 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 display and explain the difference between politicians, quote unquote, career politicians who've been there for years upon years upon years and keep taking from community and not giving back, and then you know community organizers that are are, are trying to center the voices of of community members. So I uh, I I know you haven't. Um, you haven't started serving yet, but how are you going to uh, make sure that tension um, leads to better outcomes for folks in Harlem? Because sometimes, to you know, um, yeah, the political system too is always. Uh, they always say the system is meant to do what it was meant to do. It's not broken. So how how do you? How yeah? How do you come to terms with that, and and how are you going to ensure that you know uh, there are better outcomes for for folks in Harlem? Well, a couple of ways. The first is that I'm I'm very excited to have won, and one of the things that makes my win unusual is that I did it without institutional support. Um, I did it without any establishment support whatsoever. And I did it uh, really at the chagrin of most of those who have um, been in political establishment. So the cool thing about that is that my only allegiance and my only loyalty is literally to the people of Harlem because it was a total grassroots campaign. So that's it. So that is one of the things that uh, makes me different and I think will really help with addressing that friction is that I don't owe anybody anything, right? So I I have meetings, um, all kinds of great meetings lined up with people who are now interested in talking to me because I won the primary seat and now they, they, they want to know, okay, well, like what, you know, what kind of quick pro quo we could do, what kind of deal we could do, et cetera. But for a lot of people, that type of stuff happens when they're running. And so they, they use that to get into office. And so then when they're in office, a lot of the friction comes from the fact that they're actually bound to someone or bound to something that helped get them into office. If this established political leader endorsed me and that endorsement got me into office, then I now owe them. If this uh, club or this group, this democratic group endorsed me, I owe them. If this developer, which is what happens a lot in our New York policies, um, in a New York political arena, if this developer, this real estate person backed my campaign, gave finances, if, if the police union gave money to my campaign, et cetera, then I owe them. Uh, so the very cool thing about this seat is, and, and the part that frankly has started scaring a lot of people is I don't actually owe any of, I don't owe anybody anything except the people of Harlem who through this grassroots campaign put me in this seat. So I owe a lot to the people and nothing to the establishment. And uh, it's going to be fun. That's going to be good. Yeah. that's yeah no that's that's good and um yeah we wish you we wish you all the best we know that it's going to be very difficult uh but nonetheless the, the 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 other thing that you know maybe you can comment on is there was also a lot of you know quote unquote i'll put it in inverted comments progressives <laughs> that also won so i'm thinking of uh, uh tiffany uh K- caban and uh, sandy nurse and then um yeah. 
uh, uh, District 36 or 38. Uh, I, for, I forget. I forget their name. Um, but there has been um, an, in, an, an incoming, uh, an influx of, of people that are centering community voices. So how do you think that's going to change um, the whole dynamic of New York uh, City Council? I think it's going to be a breath of fresh air. I think that the the idea that we're going to be able to have really um, frank conversations that have not been able to be had before because so many of the politicians were bought over um, and and already you know bought and paid for. Um, I don't know if we have enough of us to enact all of the visions that we really hold, but we have enough to really have the conversations. And I think that's an exciting first step to creating you know, a whole different type of city. Um, with the new city council, we do have the potential to do some uh, really amazing things. Uh, one of the things we've talked about for a long time is a uh, elected civilian review board, uh, which would be by and for the community and could fire and suspend local police officers. It's something that the um, police unions are of course against, but it would look like true accountability uh, for the community to be able to fire officers. And, and that would change, in, in my opinion, change this whole dynamic of policing. Now, I'm also an abolitionist. And one of the things I think we have a uh, real space to do is to hash it out around the budget. I do think that's going to be uh, a very interesting conversation and dynamic uh, with the um, presumptive mayor because the current Democratic nominee uh, is someone who has talked about adding money to the NYPD budget. So I think we're going to speak of friction. I think we're going to have some friction uh, there. Uh, but what I'm hoping is that we can have a real, honest, and genuine conversation about safety, one without this gaslight that adding cops is how we address safety concerns, because that is a false equivalency that has that has gotten us where we are, and that's where we continue being in a cycle of violence, uh, particularly for our Black communities, communities like mine in, in Central Harlem. So we now have all the harms of all the social ills that create uh, violence and, and crime in the first place. And we have the added harm of a, a white supremacist police force that also creates violence. So, um, so if we get to have like a real safety conversation um, with this mayor, uh, with some of the new folks we have as progressives on board to having that convo, I think uh, we can we can really push the needle and uh, invest in the things that would actually create safety. So education, like I talked about earlier, and raising literacy rates and jobs, particularly green new jobs, because we also need to totally rework the way we address uh, green energy in the city, um, updating the NYCHA buildings and, and really um, sanitation as well. So all of these are things that that I want to include in the conversation about safety, because that is actually what creates safety in a community, having the resources. Mm -hmm. what, yeah. what, is, what is the total budget for the NYPD? It is at $6 billion. It is extremely excessive. <laughs> And um, in my mind, because I merge policing and also our mass incarceration system, uh, we also have the 10 billion that is going to the new jails budget. Uh, so we have 6 billion for NYPD, 10 billion for new jails. Uh, meanwhile, uh, everything else is, is, you know, continues to get cut. So I think we, um, we really have to look at our priorities and and ultimately it's a it's a narrative that we have to debunk and that's that's the the piece that i'm excited about with my voice and other new progressive voices is let's let's go ahead and and blow up the narrative that we need these new jails and we need extra cops in order to have safety in our communities mm -hmm. let's blow that up because the safest parts in the city are actually the parts with the fewest cops. Right. 
what they have is a ton of money and resources and they have jobs and they have quality schools and they have clean parks and they have infrastructure and they they have opportunities for the youth and they have engagement activities for everyone in the community those are the places that are the safest not the places with a ton of cops Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, um, uh, I, here here in Hamilton, there's also a, a, a coalition called Defund HPS um, that has been doing work around, um, you know, the disarming, dismantling and abolishing of, of police here in Hamilton in Canada. And, you know, um, the the here the police has a budget budget of 176 million in toronto the police has a budget of 1 billion right so when you keep on adding all of these millions and billions uh as you said it takes away from investing in people and investing in the in the different elements that keep uh, our community safe transit public health education um youth activities all of those things uh um ha- having been uh invested in you know in an equitable way uh particularly in black brown and indigenous communities so um seeing that you were able to talk about uh the issues of policing and win because that was another mythical yeah. thing that has been happening is that you know if you if you say defund the police or you're talking about police accountability police brutality um and over criminalization of black brown indigenous poor people people with disabilities what have you you know you can't you can't win uh, an election so um can you connect that a little bit for for some of the folks watching yeah yeah i mean i think um i think the cool thing uh and and the thing that i think will help me when i'm in this seat as well is that i don't i i am very grateful and i feel very blessed uh for the chance to be here um but i don't have any huge deep ambition to be in politics it's really about my mission uh, and service to the community. Um, And if I can do that as a political leader, that's great because there's a huge amount of resources and power and things that we can manipulate and retool for the people because that's actually who it's supposed to be for. But if I'm not able to uh, be elected and do it there, then I will continue doing it as an organizer and activist. And that was always my attitude. So, I think um, having that, and and perhaps that's a little bit of political naivete and just being new, uh, but but having that is what helped me because I wasn't thinking so much about, well, what's the political fallout in terms of winning or losing if X, Y, or Z, you know, I I was more on the tip of, well, I'm just going to be honest. Like, let's just try this cool thing where we talk about serving people and just say what we actually believe in and actually want to do. And let's just see if people might vote for that. And if you don't vote for it, then that's okay. Um, and and um, and I think what this race showed is that more than, than we think, uh, people are woke and people are aware of what's going on, uh, at least the, our Central Harlem community. Um, and this is something that I, I um, I knew to be true, uh, but what's happened is that a lot of these races for a long time have been in the hands of such a small clique of people. It's not actually been the community voting in these local elections. It's been a very small group of mostly those who are part of democratic clubs, uh, getting together with their friends and voting for the establishment's choice. It hasn't been a genuine election where the, the block is actually involved in the vote. Um, and, um, and, and so I think that's the political strategy that made a difference here. And I would argue that if we do that strategy more and more, we will actually see more and more of radical um, uh, political leaders who do center community. Um, it, when we really start to get people, you know, what, what I often call normal humans. Um, I mean, we're all humans, right? But non-politicos, people who are really just on the block and, and trying to survive and trying to live their lives. And um, 
uh, and have very intentionally and purposely been kept out of the political process. The extent to which we can get people on the block involved, uh, we will see more changes like this and more races like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's definitely true. The, the other thing that I wanted to get comment from you on was this was the first time that uh, New York uh, used the rank ballot uh, system. And I know that's been a huge dis discussion, not only in, uh, in America, but even here in Canada, um, where municipalities are trying to find, you know, uh, more, uh, quote unquote, open democratic ways of people to, of getting people involved. From your perspective, how did the, the, the rank ballot system, you know, work or improve uh, civic participation um during this 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 primary election oh it was it was huge uh especially in this race i mean my race district nine is actually a, a prime example of how ranked choice voting can um can benefit the people because what we have had in in this seat um is you know we had an incumbent in this race you know so the the incumbent in this race uh just by sheer name recognition uh, would have won this primary, but for ranked choice voting. Now that's not to say we didn't have a lot of support because on election night, I was thousands of votes ahead of the next closest competitor. And I was only 200, just over 200 votes shy of the incumbent. But without ranked choice voting, uh, where people put me as their twos and threes and even fours and fives, uh, it wouldn't, I would not have been able to actually overtake the incumbent. And we would have been in a scenario that we have seen very often before where most people did not vote for the incumbent and yet the incumbent won because all the vote got split up between multiple challengers. That's what, you know, and so we would have had, um, what it what we have you know in the past referred to as spoilers in the race right so it really in the end it came down to me and perkins but there were a whole bunch of others also in the race um and we would have had a scenario where because others took votes with with campaigns that were not viable um that that the incumbent won but to due to ranked choice voting and the ability to actually uh, rank people, it allowed my campaign to really sail to the top uh, and, and um, overall to really back the people's choice. Because like I said, the vast majority of the district voted for change. They voted for someone not the incumbent and they actually voted for me. So the, that's, that's the beauty of ranked choice voting. Um, I also think it's an organizer's dream uh, as someone who approached the race uh, from a people powered perspective, voter contact, uh, get out the vote uh, perspective, uh, ranked choice voting serves us who are organizers because it has a lot to do with people power and you can continue conversations with people even after they have a first choice. Uh, typically, if, if I were talking to someone on the street and they said, oh, well, I'm voting for candidate A, it would be like, okay, have a good day, you know? But now uh, with ranked choice voting, it gave us the chance to actually say, well, you know what, that that person is someone you support. Uh, even cases where that's your family member, or your cousin, or you know, you have some real allegiance. Um, you know, let me talk to you about why I think I would be a great candidate and I hope you will rank me as your number two. So uh, it really opens up the conversation and it allows the people to have more of a voice. Yeah, that's, you know, that's definitely, uh, I know some of the advocates for ranked ballots, rank, uh, rank ballots here in, uh, in Ontario. Um, they all, that's one of the things they always say, you know, in the, in the first past the post, when there's no rank, uh, you have the, 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 the winner has a, a certain amount of votes. If you add every, every other vote up, 
it's always more than the incumbent. So definitely this kind of spreads and democratizes the the mm-hmm. election 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 result. So um I hope I, I hope uh New York continues to keep this. And, <laughs> yes, uh, and and I also hope that you know uh Canada and other uh, municipalities here in in the country also start adopting uh, rank ballot uh, uh, voting. So, um, can we can we switch gears to? Um, there's going to be a gen a, a general election in November, right? Yes. But then, I, I, am I right to say you you uh, you are basically a shoe in right now because uh, most of the, the there isn't a Republican um, opponent. Is that right? Uh, that is that is actually not right. Um, okay. There is. I have a Republican challenger, um, okay. and we have to go check the books on it. But we, I may have an independent challenge as well. Um, okay. Uh, but I firmly do have a Republican challenger for District Nine. Okay. So then that would happen in November. That that ele- yes. that Okay. Okay. All right. So then from now till then, what what's what's going on? So we really do need to continue the fight in this race and and we definitely need the support. Um, We're going to do a ton of get out the vote efforts for November. Uh, So anyone who is in the area, um, you you can check us out and and help volunteer. If you're not in the area, there'll be a lot of opportunities to do uh, virtual um, support uh, with our text banks and phone banks. Um, And then also, uh, any type of donation is is definitely appreciated because um, I do have to actively run a, a, a general election campaign. Um, that being said, uh, we, we're in a really great place because the real challenge was this primary and uh, and, you know, New York City in general is heavily Democratic and, and Harlem is very heavily Democratic. So, you know, we are in a, a good place. Uh, but if you are able to chip in with either time or money uh, with some of those things that we have going on, that that would be awesome. Uh, the other thing that I've just personally been doing is starting crafting my priority list for the first 100 days that I am in office. and. Um, and that has been something I've worked on with my policy team and just general input from the community. Uh, so any type of ideas around that are also really valued. Um, all of this, uh, my listening tour where people are putting in policy ideas and and, and different um, suggestions, along with uh, just ways to get involved and help with the general election campaign is on my website, uh, kristinforharlem.com. Uh, K R I S T I N two eyes because my eyes are wide open. Uh, Kristen for Harlem uh, dot com. I'm also Kristen for Harlem on all platforms. Yeah, no, yeah. this is it's going to be going to be a, a, a long, long, long haul, and hopefully, maybe after 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 the election in November, we can we can have you back uh, to 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 talk to us about you know um, what the next plans are for the next term of uh, of council. Um, oh, that would be great. Happy yes. to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, let's 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 shift gears again. Um, you know, it says you 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 are heavily involved in education. You are heavily involved in activism. You are heavily uh, involved in 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 poetry, and so I wanted to ask, how do you see? Um, we're joined we're we're joined by Sarah Jama. Sarah Jama is one of the one of the uh, greatest organizers in maybe Canada, but definitely Ontario. So, <laughs> so um, we, we, we had, we had Sarah join because, you know, just like Sarah, Sarah is an organizer heavily involved right. in politics, um, has been doing great work around 
um, defunding of police, and also uh, talking about disability rights and disability issues. And so I just wanted, we, I wanted Sarah to join to also maybe ask you some questions about, you know, how, how we connect the radical love to the work that's on the ground and how um, that can influence work moving forward for you, presumably if in if when in November you win. So uh, maybe Sarah might have uh, maybe a couple of questions. Sarah? Hi, sorry, I'm late. Um, truthfully, I woke up at 12. It's one of those weeks. <laughs> but yeah, it's nice to meet you. I guess- Oh, nice to meet you too. Um, I think your campaign is really cool. And one of the things that I struggle with is like um, the idea of like leaving grassroots work in order to do things electorally. And I'm not sure if you touched on this already, you probably have, but um, how do you justify that within yourself? Like moving into a system that's already broken versus doing work, building community externally. I'm having a hard time with that, especially because elections are around the corner and everyone's like endorse me or do this. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a real and valid question because um, I, I mean, I touched on it earlier in, in talking about how this is, this was such a grassroots campaign. And so my accountability is to the people. And so my focus is really there as opposed to traditional campaign where there's special interests and politicos and, you know, um, uh, the endorsements are, are like part of what can create that type of thing where you hold allegiance to those who are, are actually like not the, the community members. Um, but um, what you're bringing up for me actually leads me to thinking about time and, you know, time is a precious resource. And if there's time being spent on the uh, political, uh, you know, the actual electoral political uh, space, then that's time that's not being spent on the grassroots um, community service, mutual aid, and uh, and when needed uh, protest space, you know? So, um, so that's a very real, that's very real. And, and I just want to acknowledge that, you know, I think for me, part of how I have, um, justified it is is uh well two things the first is that with my schedule i'm very uh cautious to prioritize people with my schedule um and that's something that i think we need our political leaders to do more of uh what happens is that people get elected and then they spend a lot of time talking to other electeds or other politicos and not a lot of time talking to uh, what I like to call real humans, um, but um, but like, you know, non-politicos, people not in that, that echo chamber, you know? Um, so I think it has to do with making sure to designate time. Um, that's something that has worked for me. Uh, we're doing, right now we're doing a listening tour and, um, and that's involved going out on the street. Um, we have we have it from 12 to seven every day. And uh, I don't make it all day every day because there are meetings and other things, but I do make it, it's very rare that I'm not there. I do make it almost every day. Um, and, and for usually most of the time on that day. And, uh, and that's just time literally to talk to the community and connect with the community. Um, and I think every rep should have that. Everyone in politics should have that. Uh, something else that I've done is office hours where again, like non-politicos, like people who are, you can literally just walk off the street and walk into office hours. Like you can just um, join. Um, I think more things like that um, because, and, and actually budgeting time uh, the way, you know, the way we would budget money, budget time uh, to make sure that there is chunks of time that really are going to the people. And like I said, not the media, not politicos, not fellow electeds, the people uh, that there's huge chunks of time going to just accessibility, um, door to door, being on the streets. And um, that that I think is a great way to balance it um, so that you're also doing the community work. Uh, the other thing is that 
everything should have a mission that goes back to people. So even if it is a meeting with, you know, um, a, a, a fellow elected, uh, it should not be a meeting that's just like, like just to talk. Like the meeting should actually be purpose driven uh, with something about the, the people, right? So we're meeting because we wanna um, collectively talk about how we empower um, uh, the, the community, right? So like I had a meeting earlier today with um, someone who won in, in the 37th, uh, to talk, uh, a fellow black woman to talk about, well, how do we help empower black women in our communities? You know, So uh, I think that's the other way we balance it is we have very clear agendas uh, where we don't spend a lot of time just riffing and like building like a, a close like um, politico circle. Uh, we just focus on the work. That's really helpful, thank you. Uh, yeah, I've, just from the little bit that I've seen, because I've been involved in elections for three cycles in a row, uh, people get in and then they kind of disappear a bit. And so yeah. how are you gonna prevent that as somebody who is grassroots? And sorry if, I'm, if this is repeating. No, I, no, I've just I, seen I, it happen I, over and over again. No, uh, I, actually, I, I actually really appreciate the question and you're making me really actively think about it because um, it is also the huge, it, it, it's the biggest thing, it's the biggest critique. It's huge in terms of what I have, I heard from people uh, when I was running. The number one thing people were saying was, you know, you all show up when it's time to vote and then after the vote, we don't see you, we don't hear from you, nothing happens, you know? And um and I am starting to see, even with just the little bit um, of experience I've had with this like um, uh, primary win, I'm starting to see how it happens. Because what happens is once you're in a place, um, in a position of power or potential power, uh, people start uh, zoning in and asking for meetings and asking for time. and. Um, and the people who do that are usually the most privileged people who have the most amount of time with electeds all the time. And they're just very used to, they, they feel very entitled to that. They're very used to getting that, you know? Um, so I think, uh, I, I, like I said before, I think it's actually, a, I think it's a time management um, problem. And I think it has to do with values. And I think it has to do with uh, uh, like having a core belief and having core values that, you know, regardless of what's going on here in the echo chamber that is politics, uh, I'm, I'm going to do my canvas and not for votes. I'm going to do my canvas just because I'm doing a listening tour and I'm listening to people about the things they need from their elected leader and, and or dealing with constituent services um, and or doing uh, service events like the uh, mutual aid and wellness checks and food giveaways and community cleanups. Um, so I think, I think that's how. Um, I also think it helps to have a really strong team uh, there's a lot of things that, and more and more, uh, there's a lot of things that I am funneling to the team, right? So like, even though people are typically used to meeting with the um, the candidate, you know, if you have a strong policy agenda and you're trying to meet with me to talk about it, um, you know, you could talk to my policy captain. My policy captain could handle that meeting. You know, um, that gives me more time to be out in the community. You know, uh, if if you're talking about networking, you know, my my chief of staff can handle that meeting, and that gives me more time to be out in the community. So, I think uh, logistically, that's also something that really works. Um, and protecting the office hours really works and protecting the canvassing time. I mean, I think the fact that I even have canvassing time is uh, non-traditional because a lot of times uh, people only do that for the election. Uh, they don't just have general canvas time or general community time. Um, so I think very intentionally saying, okay, this is gonna be time where I'm just you know with people. Um, I think that's, 
I think that's part of the, the not being in the disappearing act. Um, I also think a political ambition has a lot to do with the disappearing act. And I just wanna call that out um, and, and name that for what that is. Uh, I think a lot of people, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, a lot of people run for office, they really have this like deep, profound um, uh, uh, wish to be an elected and they want to be an elected. And so the, 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 the goal of winning um, and winning in the future and being an elected, uh, it, it, it like takes over and becomes the primary goal as opposed to serving the people being the goal. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things that I keep in front of myself because I really, I'm a spiritual person. And I really felt called to run um, it's, it, and, and called to serve in this way uh, as opposed to, um, well, I must be the rep. It must be me. Like, that's not really what it was about. For me, it was about, I really see this need in my community. I really want to be able to do police accountability. The city council seat is where I can do something about that. I want to move money out of NYPD and into the community. This seat is where I could do something about that. Um, I want to be able to redistribute resources because the city council member gets CASA grant funding. They get city initiatives funding and that funding tends to go to nonprofits who are already raising millions of dollars in private funds and they're already very successful nonprofits and I want to take that money and give it to you know Jim on the corner who is right now doing a, a basketball clinic with youth in the community uh, for nothing not as a nonprofit and not paid just to make sure there's activities for our young men and if he's doing all of this, with nothing, when I give him some resources, he's gonna do a lot. And, and I'm looking around at organizers who are doing a lot with very little or nothing, and I want to be able to give resources to them instead of giving resources to the known nonprofits who already have tons of money coming in from private donors. So um, that, that, those are the things that compelled me to run. And I think holding true to that uh, and and the fact that like like it doesn't have to be politics like it's okay like I'm gonna serve the community regardless you know um, so the focus is about that um, and I think holding that is how we can have successful community organizers who are in office. Um, because otherwise, if we have people who are just uh, politicians, then that whole like impetus to remain a politician, oh, I have to get reelected, oh, I wanna move up, I wanna run for mayor someday, I wanna run for this someday, all of that ambition, um, that's what leads to, in, in my opinion, uh, the disconnect from the community because uh, you spend all this time trying to protect your job and or get to the next leg of your political career um, and you forget about where you came from and sort of the whole point of the whole point, you know. There's this like new, well, I don't know if this is new, I'm young. All of this is probably not new. <laughs> but there's this thing I'm noticing where like non-organizers will use organizing language to propel themselves like into community and then into office. It's happening more and more, but they're not organizers. So conversations around accountability are a lot more difficult to have once they're in there. Um, so that's one issue. And I wanted to know what you think about that. The second thing is oh, like, those, those, <laughs> those who are that's doing real. that, are so fixated on statements, right? Statements of solidarity, words of solidarity, but like not a single elected person showed up to like one of the biggest teardown of tents in our city where 80 people were evicted mm -hmm. from Ferguson simply for being outside um, with nowhere to go. Not a single elected person showed up um, to, to instances like this or instances of like uh, mass violence in our city, like over and over again, they just don't show up. Uh, not a single elected person showed up in person to mutual aid distribution. Like, they're comfortable with words and statements. So what do we do about that? Because they're, they're using the right language. Like, the, the language is cool. They're, some of them are drawing from Marx. But when they get into office, completely disappear or remove themselves from community. And then 
on their end too, I think talking to people across the province, not just Hamilton, elected people who are progressive, who have the right words, keep on saying they feel isolated from community. So it's like they expect to go in and the community will tell them what to do, but then they're not showing up, right? And so how do you balance all of these things? I think that was a lot, but I think probably Kojo knows what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, I think that's, I mean, it, it's, re that's real. So the first thing I wanna address is, is you were talking about people using organizer language who are not organizers. Uh, mm -hmm. That's very real. That definitely happens in my race where there are people co-opting the language who don't have the organizer background that I have, you know, haven't ever marched in the streets and, you know, haven't um, uh, done any mutual aid or, or wellness giveaways. And, you know, they don't come from that, from that sort of backdrop, but they were using the language. Um, I do want to say that I do think it's easy to spot the organizers when we look at the money and not enough people do that, but we should, like we should look at the money because you can spot the people who are the true organizers from how they have fundraised and where their dollars have come from and what size the donations are. And you can spot the people who really are just co-opting the language because you know they actually have huge chunks of money from people outside of the district, but they're using certain language, but like they're clearly not, the, the organizer in the race. Um, my donors were, you know, I, I had over a thousand donors. They were vast majority in district. They were vast majority like small dollar donors. I mean, you can look at that and compare and it doesn't compare. Like the person who is the organizer, it shows up that their people were community folks who gave 10, $20, gave what they could. And the, the person who's kind of front in like they, they just had, you know, a few thousand dollar donations from, from their friends. Um, that being said, uh, so, so that's how I think we should start spotting the like true phonies, like the phonies from the, the real organizers. That being said, I do think there is actually people who are organizers who get into office and then do get this like true organizers, but they get disconnected. Um, and I think it has to do again with the time management um, and with figuring out what is the most valuable, most important thing. Um, one of the things I'm really proud of is yesterday I went to a Medicare for All uh, rally and um, and you know it's interesting we have and and this was mentioned at the rally that we have many who at, at least verbally have supported medicare for all as as candidates and electeds uh but when there's you know a big uh national effort to do medicare for all rallies like all throughout the u.s um we didn't see those people show up to the rally. And to your point, many folks put out statements or a little like tweet in solidarity, uh, but did not go to the rally. Um, so that speaks exactly to your, your point. Um, and I think, like I said, I think it has to do with, with values and prioritizing, you know, I, um, I actually canceled and, and rescheduled a meeting with uh, an elected, another elected, in order to go to the rally. And we need to do more of that, um, where we say, you know what, we can meet some other time, but this rally is happening now, and I need to be present because this is an important issue. Okay, that's hopeful. I think uh, you gave me a lot to think about. It's possible to do it a different way. I'm just surrounded by a lot of people who do a lot of statements. So I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, I think you, I think, I think we can do it a different way. It's not going to be perfect. Like there is only one me and sometimes there's like four or five rallies and three meetings. And it's like, I can't actually clone myself and be everywhere at once. Um, and so a statement is going to have to do. You know, or someone who's a surrogate, who's not me, but can speak for me is going to have to do, you know, but it, so it's not going to be perfect. But I do think the the prioritizing the things that are really for and of and by the community is how we get there and, and deprioritizing, you know, 
the, the, I got to meet with this other elected because if I'm connected with them, the next election, they may endorse me and then I could win, blah, 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 blah. Like the people don't care. That's not about service, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, so you know, uh, Kristen, Sarah, thank you very much. It's we could we could do this for hours upon hours <laughs> upon hours, uh, but I think this is this is a this is a good starting point. Um, seeing what the 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 work that Kristen has done, um, and uh, it's it's not done yet. There's the general election in November, so like I said, we wish you all the best. And after you win. We'll try and get you back again, maybe even to uh, to do some workshops and stuff for some of the organizers here in Hamilton and, and connect. Because uh, I think that's one thing that we need to actively do, um, even though we might be geographically spaced out. Um, these things are very, very important. Um, I agree, so especially as like black organizers, um, that, that connection needs to be happening across space, so. Coach, your road trip? Remember? <laughs> <laughs> hey. And it was really good talking with you, Sarah. Seriously. Yeah, and we'll we'll make sure uh, I'll make sure I I uh, we do the connection for both of you. And so, uh, Kristen Richardson Jordan, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, we'll we'll continue to stay in touch. We'll continue to follow uh, your work. And um, yeah, you you know how to get a hold of us. If you're coming to Canada too, you know who to holler at. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Okay, okay. thank okay. you. Take care. Right. Okay, bye. Bye. So Sarah, um, you 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 were you 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 were supposed to join us last week. And, oh, it's and, okay. and didn't get a didn't get bye. a chance. So now uh, now that you're here. Um, can you can you speak about we, we have limited time, but the last word goes to you. Can you uh, give us uh, an update uh, about drop the charges? Yeah, so um, I don't even know where to begin. Well, so in November, we occupied City Hall for two weeks to call for the defunding of police and for that money to go into uh housing in Hamilton, and that was a direct response to a lot of us witnessing the brutal teardown at Ferguson. It was one of the largest teardowns that had existed in Hamilton. Over 80 people were displaced from a small patch of grass um, that was in no one's way, forced to move, and then from then, removed from park to park to park. And so we occupied City Hall for two weeks. Um, we. I was um, given a ticket of a minimum of $10,000. It could be a maximum of 100,000 plus jail time. We're not sure yet. I had my first court appearance. The next court appearance is in September and we're just waiting on disclosure. So the evidence that um, police have for prosecutors. Uh, we have like hundreds of people who've been emailing uh, the prosecutor to get tickets dropped. We've raised about $13,000. And then the other people who got ticketed are from Solidarity for Palestinian Human Rights McMaster, a student group. Uh, they did a giant protest in solidarity with Palestine um, and against the occupation happening there. And multiple people, who were, some who weren't even organizers of the event itself, got ticketed the same ticket that I have, minimum of $10,000, maximum 100,000 plus jail time. And then, there were multiple smaller tickets as well. So a lot, one of the people with the big tickets um, had her court appearance this week and it basically got moved because the police forgot to sign some sort of documentation. So even in their own processes, they seem to be incompetent. Uh, so she's gonna have another court date. Um, so that's a bit delayed. And then mine's in September. So that's kind of where we're at. And I think what we need from community is just to continue to share the fundraiser, share the uh, the letter template, petition template. We're dropping a really cool interview that we did with Desmond tomorrow, hopefully, sort of breaking down how these issues are connected. For me, it was like the important part was not just putting up this drop the charges thing. I wasn't even going to do it, but other people got ticketed, so it's important to do. But how are these issues connected, right? Why is it that in Hamilton, 
Black and racialized people specifically um, receive such a heavy hand when we protest peacefully and support community, but then it's okay for Nazis to be protesting in front of City Hall for over a year. And the response to that is to put up giant metal bars. Um, th the reason we're doing this is to show uh, the ways in which our legal systems and our policing systems continue the long game of coming after Black and racialized organizers. I don't know if the tickets will be dropped, and I'm not really interested in that. But how are these issues connected? I'm interested in that conversation. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, you know, la last last week, uh, Gassi talked about it. We, we uh, yeah, we, we, uh, we made a plea to people to uh to donate so i've put up the link right there you can also send e-transfers to info at defundhps.com so any little amount um we've it's really appreciated two dollars five dollars fifty dollars a hundred dollars if you if you have if you have mad money a thousand would <laughs> but um this is very important. The hashtag is drop the charges, Hammond. Um, this needs to be talked about. We're seeing, we just saw what happened um, in Toronto um, where, where, you know, police uh, literally just showed that, that there's, there's nothing surprising there. This is how they behave in an alleyway. This is how they behave day to day, hitting people, uh, putting their their knees on people's necks and heads, suffocating people, spraying people with uh, uh, sprays and all of that. So um, this idea of this is not Canada or how, how are we surprised? It's not surprising. This is what they do day in, day out. It just so happens that uh, in Toronto, there were cameras there, people were taking pictures. So Sarah, can you speak to the, and come, I know we are, we are, we are like, uh, away from the what the 1 p.m. end mark, but we gotta we gotta do this. So, can you speak to the incumbent issue? Um, I think people are talking about Toronto, which is which is very important. No, no, we're not. We that that's not the the issue here. But Hamilton also has incumbents, and the the as you said, you know, Hamilton was 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 tearing down incumbents way way before um uh, uh toronto and during the pandemic in the height of the pandemic so can you speak to that a little bit um so that folks in hamilton can can know what's going on yeah for sure it's important to note that uh they i think as somebody who was at trinity bellwoods and lamport stadium both uh encampment evictions the hamilton issue i feel like is a lot worse and here's why Ferguson had 80 people, 80 to 100 people in it when it was evicted. Uh, Lamport Stadium had 19 people in it. Um, what we have in Hamilton is a lot more nefarious. We have this encampment protocol, which says that our bylaws say that, you, that residents who are living in a park can only be there for 14 days before they're evicted. Whereas in Toronto, it's a lot more ambiguous. Um, people can stay where they are for a lot longer um, and not be specifically um, distanced from uh, their support services that they receive. Here, it's it's already part of the culture now that encampment residents already know that they have to pick up their stuff after 14 days and get moved from park to park. Um, so the Hamilton Encampment Support Network, which I know Gashi spoke about last week, was created in kind of response to that to say, uh, this protocol isn't enough and there is more that should be done to support encampment residents, including defense when it gets to that point. Um, so what we've been doing is we've been dropping off tents, uh, connecting with people in different parks to figure out where they are and what they need and what supplies are required on their end. Um, but then also talking to them about their rights because a lot of them don't a lot of them are so used to this idea of picking up and moving and are, are used to the brutality uh, that comes from police. The day that the Hamilton and Cayman Support Network launched, we got a call from the hub saying that 
three different houseless people were arbitrarily beat up by three different police officers. So the, the issue is the same here, except that it's a lot more nefarious. You'll see that the bullying that comes, so what you have during the day is like you have city staff and you have the social navigators that come in. Sometimes they bring food uh, to residents and they say, hey, you know what? Like, you know, you have only 14 days left. And then at nighttime, if it's like closer to the 14 day or past that, They'll like drive up onto, and we've seen this at J JC Beamer, drive up onto the grass, shine their lights, slash the tents, and harass people into leaving the parks at nighttime when no one's watching, right? So Hamilton is a lot more nefarious in terms of how they deal with it, whereas Toronto, the police are more emboldened and will do whatever they want during the day. We haven't had a, a true encampment defense process in Hamilton yet. Um, we're waiting on residents to decide when and how they want that to occur. But when it does occur, I anticipate you'll see uh, similar levels of escalation because uh, there hasn't been a defense, even with the AD at Ferguson. What's happening is people are just mo being moved from park to park. And one of the scary things about what happened in Toronto was that Alexander Park was cleared in part so that filming could occur, right, for a movie. Like people were ev evicted and then a couple days later, a, a movie shoot was set up there in the same way that we've seen that here um, in Hamilton where people have been evicted and then, but movie, movie setups are allowed to be using public space. Um, so who's profiting off of this? Why does this keep existing and occurring in this way? And why can't houseless people exist in public? Uh, the, the language that Tori uses is the same language that Eisenberger uses, saying that, like, uh, you know, people can go indoors, people can go into the shelters, but the shelters aren't housing, right? People, you, I've lived in shelters before. Like, it's not what people think it is. It's not just like a home. You have to, you have to, for especially for a man, you have to line up to secure your spot and then you're kicked out the next day. It's not like permanent. It's not even semi-permanent. The women's shelters are a lot different in that way, but they're a lot more full also. Whereas there's a bunch of empty spots in the men's shelters because of how bad it is. Um, people aren't safe there. It's treated like a prison. A lot of people who've been in prison have said that. Um, there's a lot of like violence in there. And then for people who are considered disruptive, and this is the language that the city actually uses, people who are disruptive. Um, and often that tends to be people with untreated mental health concerns or who are, who are withdrawing from substance use because you're not allowed to bring drugs into shelters. Like the people who are disruptive end up like um, fighting with each other or getting evicted from the shelter and banned. Like one indigenous man in a wheelchair was banned until 2025. And so what do you do then, right? Your, your body requires a substance to live and you're being told you cannot have that here with you. And then you're being told you're disruptive and then you're being told kicked out again. So then what are you supposed to do? Like these policies around what you can and can't do with your body are really ableist because the shelter requires that you physically change how you are in order to be in that space and you adhere to bureaucracy that's not built for you as like a disabled person, a person with mental illness um, who needs specific supports. And so the people are being failed by the shelters on purpose at this point, because it's not new information and then being kicked out of the parks or beat up for not leaving the parks when no one is watching. Um, it's pretty bad. And so, yeah, follow the Hamilton and Canvas Support Network. I, I, as of this week, I'm no longer on the steering committee because I want to focus on DJ No more um but yeah so there's a new steering committee of cool folks who are building this out um, and continuing to provide supports for wards one two and three and as we onboard more volunteers we hope to expand across the city uh the first training for this cohort two which was another 30 people just happened and there's a wait list of another 30 volunteers uh as well who are waiting to be trained so in the next month or so, we should have like onboarded over 90 people to be doing this work in encampments. Mm -hmm. And and just so people know, you know, when we talk about encampments, people think, I know you said you're focusing on wards one, two, three, and four. There are also encampments in Stony Creek and up on the mountain. So, um, you know, uh, obviously we won't say where they are, but, um, they are they are across the city. It's not it's not um, 
uh, geographically uh, restricted to downtown Hamilton. So these are things that we really have to take seriously. And so if you want to connect with uh, the Hamilton Encampment Support Network, the website is hesn.ca. And then if you want to send them an email, info at hesn.ca. You can also call them 289-273-4376. So um yeah thing i'll also say is like yeah the encampments exist across the city but ward two is specifically bad because jason Farr uh has a lot of developer friends and a lot of his campaign is funded by developers and so his thing is he like and we've seen now even private security harass encampment residents in ward two specifically like we have pictures of it happening but his thing is like he will call city staff over and over again and berate them for not getting people out of parks. Whereas some other city councilors keep their mouth shut, which is the bare minimum as people who are making over $100,000 in salary. He will go out of his way to call city staff or drive around his ward to make sure that encampment residents are out by any means necessary, um, which is causing further like physical brutalization of people in these tents. And he does this because of his conceptions about property value. Like Ferguson was in his ward, it was a strip of grass like that wasn't harming anyone. And he uses the fact that sometimes residents also call in saying they don't like these tents um, to fuel his stepping in, overstepping as a counselor to try to get people kicked out. Um, yeah, pay attention to the encampments in your area on the mountain. Like some people are unkind. Like we had an issue, I think at JC Beamer where People during Canada Day were shooting fire um, fireworks at tents, right? Completely inhumane. And so that kind of behavior is fueling like the bureaucratic violence coming down from a city councillor who's going out of his way to kick people out too, on top of the physical violence of police, on top of like physical violence from residents who are like shooting firecrackers. It's not okay. And so it's your obligation to pay attention to what's going on in your neighborhood and like um, protect people, ask what they need, because any one of us are closer to being homeless than we are to being a billionaire. Um, a lot of people in the Encampment Support Network have been homeless as well, right? And so it could be any one of us, and it's not enough to just say that you care about your community. You have to show it for those who are the most marginalized. Even if you don't agree with encampments existing, none of us want the encampments to exist, but know that the structures are not set in place for people to survive anywhere else right now. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, in the middle of a pandemic, the, 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 the biggest public health crisis we've, we've seen, and uh, in, in the midst of a climate crisis as well, where even living outside now is also a public health crisis when you have smoke in the, in the air, right? So we really, yeah, I, I, I won't, I could go on and on. So, um, yes, thank you, Sarah. And, um, I guess now that you've, now that you've joined, you've, you've joined, uh, the communal, maybe you become a weekly participant. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm bad with timing, so it depends on if uh, okay. I missed last week, so sorry. Yeah, no, it's all good. It's all good. So yeah, thank you. Uh thank you very much for, for joining this week's uh, this week's episode. And uh for those of you that are watching, my last uh my last plea again is drop the charges, Hammond. Uh you can send an e-transfer info at defundhps.com. Uh, this week, we spoke to Kristen Richardson Jordan, um, running for District 9 in Harlem, Harlem, where the Harlem Renaissance started. That's that's the district she's, she's repping, running for. We had a conversation with them. And then uh, Sarah, Sarah joined halfway through uh, to ask some questions and then also give an update on what has been going on with, with the encampment. So uh there you have it folks episode six is done um as always please have conversations make connections and continue to build a community because that's all we have without a community we are all left behind like dust so thank you sarah see you all next Bye. week maybe.